Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to be delving into something called micro virtual machines. Does that mean we're going back to the Apple II? No, nah, stick around right after this. <music> So, uh, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about Firecracker today. And, uh, but I guess before we delve into that, as always, whenever there's a solution, you need to understand the problem, right? I mean, it's, it's great that there's this, this solution that's out here, but what does it do for us? And why do, do I need something like this? So let's talk a little bit about the problem statement for a moment. So cloud computing. Uh, we all know that's an easy way to get people to use someone else's hardware, right? I mean, you could spend your money on building up your own infrastructure, or perhaps you can pay for what you use. I mean, the argument has always been that when you host your self-hosting, you're, you're paying for that hardware whether it's being used or not. So, And then in the cloud services, you're only paying for the amount of processing that you and storage that you use. So... But providing those kinds of things today, it's not enough. I mean, there's so many cloud providers today, they're all falling over each other and trying to get your business. So, but, uh, and the other problem is, is that the cloud itself has become very complicated. Uh, we have distributed stores, we have load balancers, we have object stores, we have serverless and container automation, we have orchestration. I mean, you need an expert almost, and it's trained in every aspect of those systems in order to manage them effectively. Because essentially, you may be using their hardware, but it's you who are in control of it. So it's you that has to do some of the management on those systems yourself. You at least need to understand it, whether or not you're in a, in a part and uh, parcel to actually controlling it, but you do need to understand it. And that it is becoming a very complex issue. But the real big problem is more for the, uh, more for the cloud provider itself. And I would argue that even if you are self-hosting, this is an issue for you as well. There's separation between different services and customers, and, and that's a constant problem. Let me give you an example. So I have two machines, and I have two applications on it. Let's assume for a moment that they're the same customer, but maybe one of them contains financial information that I don't want to share outside of a select group of people within my organization. The other application is a web application that maybe does e-commerce or maybe it does uh, maybe it provides services to, you know, uh, other businesses to sell and, and provide them with, uh, with services and goods as well. So I don't necessarily want to mix those two. But what happens is that if, uh, my, if I, as my load comes, becomes bursty, that is, uh, those are all going to hit the same machine because if I'm isolating those applications to a box, then this box is going to get completely, let's say that this is the one that becomes bursty. It's the one that's just going to be busy as heck. Meanwhile, I've got something over here that I could use, but I can't because I don't want to risk uh, exposing that data to this side of the business, right? So, uh, yeah, so I'm really not utilizing my hardware as effectively as I could. So, yeah, exactly. So, um, so how do we spread the load between the servers without losing that isolation that the hardware is providing with us? We could add more virtual machines, and we could make sure that they're using different network hardware and they're using different storage, uh, but that's really getting complex. We've been adding more complexity to an already complex problem. And plus, you know, the risk of exposure with the traditional virtual machine is still there. I mean, you, you do share a lot of the same infrastructure. You stay, you do, there's storage pools that are, you could be sharing. There is network pools that you could be sharing. So, yeah, the risk is there. So how, how, do, we, how do we deal with this? So that's what Firecracker was really designed to try to solve. And it is an open source, it is a virtualization, virtualization uh, software, and it's based on the, the KVM. And Firecracker is the, a replacement for QEMU. Okay, wait, wait a minute. So I'm gonna replace QEMU? Why would I do that? QEMU has all of, if you see from the architecture drawing here, 
it is the one that provides all of the emulation for my de my virtualized devices like my CPUs, my uh, my storage, my network, my memory. It's cutting and managing all this stuff for me. Why in the world would I want to get rid of that? Plus, it also offers it also offers emulation for different CPUs. That now I don't know if you're using that, but that is a, a feature of QEM of QEMU, or KMU, uh, as what I prefer to call it. But it yeah it, it and uh, it manages all those devices, whether it's your disk, your video, your keyboard, your mouse, your networking, everything. All of that is being managed. It also handles the startup and the shutdown for the virtual machines. And in other words, QEMU is not a lightweight application. It is pretty big, uh, and it does an awful lot, and it's very good at what it does. So uh, here's, the, here's the deal, and this is what changed. Micro virtual machines were, is a hardware isolated virtual machine that's created by a microvisor, not a hypervisor. So uh, it's isolation to prevent malware from spreading. So then that, in other words, a micro VM, when it comes up, it runs for a while, and when it shuts down, it gets obliterated, it gets destroyed. So it's no longer around. So anything that wrote to that file system that was inside of that micro VM is gone, completely history. Now there's a way to handle pervasive data when you have that. But yeah, the, 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 core, the core thing about micro VMs is they're designed to come up, run, and be destroyed. So, uh, Zen and, uh, so it's a, it's a Silicon Valley corporation by the name of Bromide or bromium, bromium, uh, was the first to actually create this. And they, they actually used their, <laughs> their, they actually challenged Microsoft and uh, with their, uh, I think it was one of their facilities that they had for managing machines that they, and they had just basically poked so many holes through it, they were able to take control of the environment. Well, Microsoft took a step back and said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, What's, you know, what are we gonna do here? And, and so uh, Bromium showed them this technology that would solve the problem. They actually, they didn't hack into Microsoft, they just <clears throat> demonstrated a way that you could hack into uh, their virtualized engine. And that scared them. Anyway, Zen and Citrix are both partners with, uh, became partners with Bromium to develop this software called MicroVM. Uh, today, Hewlett Packard owns this company, and uh, uh, they're, and they're, uh, a lot of their things have been spun out to the open source community. So, uh, so what does this got to do with Firecracker? We were, weren't we talking about Firecracker? Why are we talking about micro VMs? Well, Firecracker is lightweight, and it creates and manages micro VMs. That's what it does. Uh, and it brings the speed of containers, but it adds the security of, of virtual machines. And I've talked this, about this before when I was talking about Kata containers. Kata containers do exactly the same thing. There's a small, lightweight virtual machine that's installed with Kata. Uh, and in fact, uh, Firecracker works with Kata, and it also works with a number of others, including Docker. Uh, so you can, you can create uh, small footprint virtual machines with containers like Docker. Uh, so you have, you know, the problem with, that you have with containers, as I've said this before, is that you have a host operating system that all of the Docker containers can communicate with. Well, that <laughs> there is your vector for attack uh, to uh, to gain access to the machine. If you gain access to the host, game over. And so the lightweight VMs kind of block that. It, they prevent one container from talking to another through the localized host because there is only one host uh, OS that's available to that container. Uh, and it offers enhanced security, uh, Firecracker offers enhanced security over traditional virtual machines by shedding all these unnecessary devices and features that are inside of, of uh, QEMU. So, uh, and that reduces the attack surface. And anytime you can do that, that's a better security model, right? Less interfaces I have open, the better my, uh, the better I can manage the uh, system as a whole. So where did it come from? Who 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 started this thing? Well, it was developed by Amazon Web Services, for originally for the AWS Lambda and for their uh, Fargate uh, technologies. Uh, it runs on Linux uh, and it is uh, and it is open source. Like I said, it's been spun out to the open source community. There's a GitHub page that we'll look at in a bit. 
Uh, and, it's, and as long as you have a, a, a Linux KVM uh, installed and you have kernel 4.14 or higher, you're good to go. You can run it. Um, the, it use, the lighter weight VMs start up faster. They take less resources. You can even allocate you know, smaller amounts of, uh, and we'll talk, allocate allocation units instead of, of a larger and larger blocks. So it's supported on Intel and AMD today. ARM is, uh, I think it's currently an alpha state right now, um, but there is an ARM version of it. Uh, and it is based on an Apache 2 license, so you're free to use it. It's free for you to install and, and to play with if you want to. So why do we need Firecracker? What's the reason behind this? What's the purpose? I mean, so what, right? What's the so what? That's always the question I ask. So what? Uh, better utilization of the server uh, resources. I saw a, a video by Wendell uh, over on Level 1, and it was a few weeks ago, where he's been working on this server consolidation project where he's using larger and larger uh, Epic processors from AMD to consolidate 24, I think it was 24 servers that he had in two racks down to four. And uh, <clears throat> Wendell, you could do a lot better than that uh, because the virtual machine technology that you might be using, I don't know if you're using Firecracker, but it might, that you might be using, you could actually probably shrink that down even more. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, because it provides separation between the containers one from another, and it allows mixed lo workloads on the same server. So, in other words, I don't have to maintain one, like if I have my two customer or my, my one customer solution where I have a, a financial application on one side and a customer-facing application on the other side, I can mix those now. So if they become bursty, I could use two servers and I could host multiple copies of that container across both of them and then spread my load between those two servers. So whichever one of them starts to require more resources, I'm free to, to, to crank up more containers and more micro VMs in order to support the load. And as soon as they're done, tear them back down again and return the machines for use for something else. So yeah, I mean that's the whole thing. That's the whole thing behind uh, this kind of workload. Will this kind of workload work in a self-hosted environment? Absolutely, it will. Absolutely, this is not just a cloud service uh, environment at all. So this could work even in self-hosted. Uh, again, the whole idea here is to reduce the amount of hardware that's required to support a given set of services. Now, can everything move to it? No. No. <laughs> no, of course not. Uh, you know, it, 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 this is meant for uh, services loads or software as a service loads. So why, why do we need Firecracker? Well, speed. So what, what's the so what? What's the major speed? This is what Amazon says in their experience with Firecracker in their uh, cloud service today. Uh, they can spin up, they, they can spin up uh, a VM. They can load one in as little as 125 nanoseconds. And with that speed, uh, Firecracker can spin up up to 150 micro VMs per second. That's pretty impressive uh, if you stop and think about it. I mean, sure, that's we're not talking about home server loads here. We're talking about enterprise loads here today. But um, yeah, so that by stripping out all this stuff that QEMU has in it that we don't need, and just using Firecracker for uh, the system, software as a service loads, yeah, we're good. So you can do, you can have scaling and efficiency. You can you can bring up CPU allocations with as little as a quarter CPU. Wait, what? A quarter CPU? I've never seen that before. Well, you will in Firecracker. Uh, you, the the VM storage ha overhead is less than six megabytes. So, yeah, <laughs> maybe bytes actually less than six maybe bytes. So it's pretty small. It doesn't have a very large footprint. So um, Firecracker does include, and I'll show you the architecture in a minute, but it does include a rate limiter. So if, uh, if you have contention and all of a sudden things become bursty, uh, it, it can prevent what, that particular VM from being overloaded. And then there would be some software behind this that would then, indicate, that would then be alerted to say, hey, this VM is overloaded, spin one up. So yeah, and that would allow me then to scale that, that load across multiple systems using the load balancers to manage it. So yeah, this is the, uh, this is the architecture and you can see down here, this is KVM uh, right here on this side and then of course my bare metal and then this is my guest OS with the containerization load up on top of it. 
And then as far as Firecracker is concerned, you have uh, a RESTful API to control it. Uh, you have your network, your storage, your metadata services that describes your services, and then this rate limiter that will then spin up and control what's going on here under the hardware itself as, as a whole, how many VMs are running, what they're doing, and how, and how much resources they're taking. So via, uh, virtual machines, um, we talk normally about you know impressive workloads of 18 to 36 VMs per core. Yeah, how about a thousand per core <laughs> on the same machine? So, yeah, that's the difference. That's the difference. So, that's basically what I wanted to talk about today, and um, just kind of a short talk. Uh, I, I I always like to go back in and talk about enterprise a little bit too, because I mean that is what if we are working in this industry, chances are we're going to be crossing this bridge at sooner, sooner or later. And it's always helpful to understand some of the things that are around. I, I don't know how many of you are using Firecracker. I mean, whether it's on AWS or whether it's on a self-hosted system or whether it's on some other cloud provider. But uh, and if you are, let me know. I would love to know what you're, how you're using it and what your experiences have been with it. I have just started to play with it here. And uh, I have not ripped out QEMU completely. I, but I do have a server stood up where I am running and playing around with it. I might share that with you sometime in the future if you guys are interested. Um, but I, I, I mean, based on past performance of enterprise topics on this channel, there hasn't been a whole lot of interest. But be that as, as it may, I, I still want to try to provide you with information that may help. Maybe it'll give you some new direction or maybe stimulate something that you might be interested in and give you an idea of what's out there. So as always, I hope you enjoyed this today. And please like and subscribe. Hope to see you all again real soon. And as always, bye for now. Thank you.